this is Stalinism. Oh well, yeah. You know, this is a kind of neo-Stalinism, and China is taking the place that the Soviet Union used to occupy for Stalinists back in I don't know the 50s and 60s, right?、Um, and so it's very much of a piece with,、um, you know, it's a lot of there's a lot of Marxist-Leninism out there. We've talked about that a kind of neo-Stalinism, a kind of neo-Maoism, and a kind of a strange kind of Stalinism and Maoism that is. Willing to basically argue for the socialist bona fides of the capitalist rotor revisionist Chinese Communist Party, and you know Communist China,、um, which the Maoists themselves call fascist.、Uh, the actual Maoists, right,、uh, call Xi Jinping's、um, China and Deng Xiaoping's China fascist after the purge of the Gang of Four. All right, Chris. Well, welcome to、um, the Catron Zone this week. Again, it's Friday. I'm introducing both of these the same way because I'm not sure which one we're going to run first, but possibly this one.、Um, we're going to go to Milwaukee, and then I'm going to come to Chicago. You live in Chicago for the political conventions for the Democratic and Republican conventions. We both over the last week watched、uh, two films. One is The Last Party. And the other is medium cool,、um, and one was filmed in 1968, the other in 1992. They're very different, except for they have the same topic. Or、uh, with medium cool, it's just an element of the movie, which is、mm-hmm. the political conventions and、uh, you know Democratic convention in 1968.、Um, but I watched them both, and now I'm I'm wondering, are we up to the task of creating a, a film, a document? Film. Yeah,、uh, that's comparable to either of these. I mean, I think either. Medium Cool. That's right. Medium Cool is, to, in my mind, the superior film, but but nonetheless, in either case, are the, is it's not just our talent as filmmakers,、um, but because I know you're a, a video artist with、uh, you know quite a lot of talent in that arena, and I have some editing talent. I think we could do it, but is this moment even going to allow us, right, to make this kind of film? So, right. I'll start with that question. Or what do you? And I guess the other way to put it is, what were those films doing that we want to try to do? Okay, so、um, medium cool, you know, is kind of a classic of cinematic history, and it's a kind of it's a fiction story shot in Chicago around the time of the Democratic National Convention and the events. Taking place around that, so the the protests, the rioting, the police repression,、um, is a kind of a backdrop for a fictional story about a news reporter、mm-hmm. um, who is a cinematographer and photographer, and、um, who has a kind of a cynical attitude about like media and journalism. You know, kind of if it bleeds, it leads. Kind of journalism. Um, which、mm-hmm. was already very well established by that point, and、um, he basically、uh, gets involved romantically with people who had relocated to Chicago from Appalachia, and that was a thing. Well, with the mother of a, a single mother, yeah. But yeah. she had left West Virginia, I think, to come to Chicago. Mm-hmm. Um, and、um, or some some Appalachian place, and、uh, I live in the neighborhood uptown Chicago that was the ground zero for that, and that was actually documented by、um, kind of social justice photojournalists,、um, and so it was it was like a, a place where African Americans and Appalachian whites, you know, transplanted from the South, kind of cohabitated. And、um, had fled rural poverty to experience urban poverty, and also this is like a center still of like drug rehab facilities,、hmm. because it was kind of a place of、um, kind of abject, you know, drug use and、um, you know, heroin addiction and you know the the kind of stuff that we we think about today, which is like the slow suicide of down and out working class people, 
now it's called like the opioid epidemic, but we could just call it heroin, <laughs> right? And fentanyl is a heroin substitute. It's artificial heroin, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, you know, it resonates in many ways. Um, and the what's rendered as backdrop, which is the political crisis of the Democratic Party around the Vietnam War, and around LBJ dropping out of running for re-election and RFK being assassinated and also um, Martin Luther King being assassinated. Um, Malcolm X had already been assassinated sometime before that. Um, you know, a real crisis of American politics that brought Nixon to power mm -hmm. in that election. In other words, the, the protests at the Democratic National Convention just told the public that the Democrats were not up to governing, mm. right? That they were the party of chaos, disorder, failure, collapse, right? Um, as Nixon put it in Oliver Stone's film on Nixon, mm -hmm. uh, Vietnam killed the Democrats. And obviously now people are hoping that Gaza kills the Democrats. But they're not really hoping for that because, of course, the left in 1968 did not want to bring Nixon to power. They did. But that was right. The dream, right. And they were horrified by that. And, of course, they thought Nixon was a fascist, even though he was actually the peace candidate. He promised to end the Vietnam War. He had a secret plan. <laughs> and he did have a secret plan. The secret plan was um, allying with China against the Soviet Union. And that had to be a secret plan because the establishment would have done everything to stop him if they knew that that was the plan. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. But him and Kissinger had, 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 you know, come to this conclusion. The way to win the cold war is to break up the communist bloc. And they did. Now I can't help but bring up the fact that, um, there was recently, and nobody believed Nixon when he said he had a secret plan. They were like, Oh, he's full of shit. Right. Gordon Vidal famously said, Nixon cares about nothing but power. Sound familiar? Mm -hmm. Isn't Trump full of shit and he's not interested in anything but power? Well, I mean, allying with China was a great way to get power. The, the, um, you except know, except they, they knocked him out, didn't they? According to one theory, the FBI yeah, they and the CIA got rid of Nixon because he did that? Well, I think that it, because he did that, perhaps, but yes. That because he did that. that, meaning the CIA outfit that uh, broke into the Watergate building allowed themselves to be caught, and the FBI leaked, you know, deep throat FBI, out of loyalty to America, leaked about the corruption of the Nixon administration uh, to try to cover up the Watergate. So the CIA and the FBI both participated in Nixon's downfall. Yeah, and and you know, lucky for us because we got Jimmy Carter. Um, Don't forget Gerald Ford. Yeah, I'm not forgetting the Saturday Night Live skits. Yeah, right. right. Kind of a hapless guy, kind of an inoffensive hapless guy. Right. Kind of a but, liberal but, Republican. Yeah, but okay. But back to um, well, you know, I'm going to drop what I was going to say. We can get to it later. R remind me, there was something I wanted to mention about China, but I'm going to drop it for now. Okay. <laughs> go okay. But go back to um, medium cool. Um, I'm just going to. So it's the Marshall McLuhan phrase, by the way. Right. Right. It's about. Um, I think it was television that was a cool medium. I'm not sure mm -hmm. that cinema was a cool medium. No, I don't know if it was either, but yeah, but television, television was, was because it was about a news journalist, a photojournalist, a you know, I guess a video journalist, but really a film journalist, but for television, right? The cool, main like Adorno talks about bourgeois coldness, cool, right? It not cool as be, in hip or no, no, or, it's not meant to be hip, but it's also not meant to be um, bourgeois coldness, it's cold and hot in Marshall McLuhan's theory. Mm -hmm. is a hot medium is sensory overload intense mm -hmm. and a cool medium is something that demands more imagination from the viewer or the reader to make it work yeah, so, but in medium cool uh -huh. that the medium cool is right. bourgeois coldness it's it, it oh absolutely it is yeah 
Yeah, but I mean, yeah, in McLuhan's theory, not so much, but in medium cool, they're in the film. It. But yeah. I think the comment that the film is making in adopting that Marshall McLuhan title mm -hmm. is that in order to make sense of the world, actually, you can't just take the appearance of things. Mm -hmm. Because it's about the journalist's disenchantment with his own profession. Right. Right. Photographing everything, filming everything, broadcasting everything. Um, and, uh, you know, spoiler alert, um, uh, he may or may not die in the end, but it, he, he probably is dying in the end. But it, there's a car crash in which the woman he was um, involved with is killed and in which a passerby photographs them before driving off without helping. And, and at the beginning of the movie, yes, he had come across a car crash. Yes. And they had filmed the scene, yes. the, the um, sound recorder, the, 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 the sound guy with his tape recorder uh, filmed the last breath yes. of the woman who was lying on the pavement. Yes. Um, and he turns off the car horn that's stuck in an on position with, so he can capture her last breath on audio yep. tape. And then they wander away. Uh, the the journalist, you know, the leading man lights up a cigarette, I think, and he says, oh, we should probably call an ambulance. Um, yeah, so there's, there's, yeah, there's a there's a circle, you know. Yeah, there uh, is. There's, yeah. It bookends the whole thing. So mm -hmm. he he starts off as the photographer and he ends up being photographed in the same position. Now, by the way, so Doug and I, you, you and I are, uh, we're old enough. Do you remember... Um, well, Faces of Death at the video rental store. The creepy mm. news footage of people dying. Right. Yeah, I, I, yeah I've seen that. Right? I've heard but, of it. Yeah. But also Driver's Ed. These are the sounds of dying. These are right. the sights of dying. And I joked with my friends. I was like, when are they going to bring out the pails full of, the buckets full of guts and blood? This is the mm -hmm. smell of dying. <laughs> You know, and then they'll light them on, like, to bring a bucket of human guts and light it on fire. <laughs> I love dying, you know, because, um, you know, this is to tell us not to speed and not to drive drunk and whatever. Um, I don't think they'd allow that now. Like, that stuff was very traumatic. I don't know if you remember mm -hmm. that stuff. I do, I don't yeah. Allow that in schools now. It'd be too triggering. Uh, probably not. Um, well, I wanted to, <laughs> the, the other thing I want to admit, point out, though, is, we're old enough also to recognize some of the faces in the film. At least I was Peter uh, Boners. I think is how you say his name uh, plays a sound man in this uh, film. Uh, he was on the seventies version of new heart. He played the dentist in the next. Oh, uh -huh. um, and uh, the, um, the leading man was in the black hole, Robert Forrester. He, mm. he started in the Disney movie, the black I hole as the captain. So it, for me, it's like, oh, because I'd just seen the it's last It's an avant-garde film, but also kind of mainstream. Mm -hmm. And also, it was, I saw The Last Party, and that was a documentary. I mean, it had yeah. Robert Downey Jr. in it, movie right. star, but he was right. playing himself. This was a blending of fiction and, and reality. Right. Um, and, but it had that uh, documentary feeling to it. I would also say that the journalist, in the, the leading man, he is disenchanted with his profession, but mostly because he's not being allowed to do it. Yes. Um, yes. He's being blocked from investigating um, a, a, a cab driver who had turned in $10,000 he found in his cab to the police and the police won't take it. So like, what, what is this pointing to? What's what is, why won't they take the $10,000? Whose is it? He wants to investigate that. He thinks there's uh, some corruption. connection to, to gun running in chicago and uh that has official collusion the official collusion yeah right 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 and and so and and he also finds out that his work is being turned over to the fbi the film footage he turns uh -huh. into news. so he's being blocked by this cool medium from doing hot reporting which would be you know using his brain investigating following up doing actual journalism um so you're, you're right. It, it, it is it's a critique of the cool medium, for sure. Um, but also a kind of um, a challenge, meaning it's a kind of 
the viewership of, I mean, think of the Vietnam War, mm -hmm. you know, which is the controversy of the time. And also, you know, the plot with the woman, it, it, her husband had run off on her, but um, his son, the guy's son, the woman's son, believes that he's in Vietnam, the father. And even though the mother knows she doesn't like contradict him, but the mother is like, oh no, he just ran off, he's probably dead. You know, a kind of death of despair, working class kind of abject situation, but the, but the son thinks it's something more noble and heroic, died in Vietnam, or not died in Vietnam, all fighting in Vietnam. And people thought at the time that what made the Vietnam War so controversial in public opinion was the nightly newscasts, the footage, the direct broadcasting of war footage from the war. And, um, you know, that, that this radicalized people against the war, um, that this kind of, um, you know, it was brought home. And of course, in our time, starting with the Gulf War, but maybe even before that, maybe with the invasion of Grenada, mm -hmm. which had a kind of effect on me at the time, um, uh, there was a major effort to control. What yeah, they were embedding, embedding embedding a journalist with the soldiers, with the U.S. soldiers. Which and they also did in Vietnam, by the way. They embedded them, but they had less control over what they reported. Mm -hmm. And I should also say that, you know, the big controversies of our time, like around WikiLeaks, was the leaking of military footage. Right. Right. And so, you know, which exposed the reality of um, the sordid reality of the war on terror. Mm -hmm. um, so there was this idea that the medium of television had not been available before the Vietnam War, and therefore the medium itself played a role politically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And just straight reportage was enough to scandalize the war mm -hmm. and the public in the face of the war. And I think that the film is a comment on that too. Meaning it both, it might agree with that, but also disagree with that. Meaning that obviously the public had to be predisposed because it's not as if the public was unaware of the horrors of war. You know, right? They, yeah, they were not unaware. I mean, after all, you know, the, there was a massive involvement in not only World War II but the Korean War within living memory. There mm -hmm. were World War II and Korean War veterans who were, you know, traumatized, scarred. You there know. were still World War One veterans. You know, there were still World War One veterans, absolutely. And so, mm -hmm. um, the question is, what people make of it. And that's, that's where I'm sticking with the Marshall McLuhan definition, that the viewer, the audience has to fill in a lot with the mm -hmm. imagination, meaning people made sense of what they saw on TV with respect to the Vietnam War and drew conclusions based on how they understood things and how they imagined things, rather than just, oh, well, it was shocking to people, the brutality of war broadcast nightly into your living room. Right. Right. It wasn't just that. And I think that that's because after all, um, you know, uh, filming the results of car crashes, you know, that's why I brought up our driver's ed films that we watched in high school. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Has it reduced the amount of car crashes? No. Has it made mm -hmm. people less, less likely to drive? No. Less likely to drive drunk? No. Less likely to speed? No hasn't had it, that effect, <laughs> right? Um, and so there's no, there's no particular reason why we should expect the medium itself to do anything. And I think that that's really the point of the film is that mm -hmm. there's a kind of disparity between image and reality and between the medium and how it's used and social reality, mm -hmm. right? It's a kind of an existential crisis of the main character, I think is what yeah. unfolds in the narrative of the film. 
And the Appalachian family is a central part of that, right? Because it sort of cures him of his cynicism. It does, yeah. Right? Um, that otherwise he starts off with and which the film ends with. Right? Mm -hmm. Meaning he's gone through this existential crisis and this kind of realization, but the world continues as it was before. Right. Through the medium. Right. Right. So, so okay, when we go to the conventions, we're not going to be creating this kind of film. We're not, as, as far as I can tell, I mean, we don't have... That's what we want to do. We I can mean, do anything we, that we want. That's true. Um, do you do you want to write a script where we have a, a main character acting out a story with the conventions in the background? Well, even I mean, if I could do that. Were, even if it were, so the other film, Last Party with Robert Downey Jr., even if it were a straight documentary, mm -hmm. it's still a story. It's still scripted. Yeah. Right? Well, yes, I guess so. Yeah. I mean, it is going to be scripted, scripted in the sense that we we are always scripting our own lives. We're always narrating ourselves, and, and then, definitely then that's going to be edited as well, which will it's definitely be edited for sure. Right. But right. like Robert Downey Jr. obviously has like he, he's living his own story. Oh yeah. Right, and we're just right. watching. Yeah, it, it's not it's not as interesting. His story is not as interesting as uh, or as dominant in the movie as Here's the question, Doug, is the Doug Lane story as interesting? Uh, well, I I think it could be. Yeah. Uh, as, yeah. Yeah. But I'd have to write it. I can't just act it out like You Robert can't Dan. just be it? No. You can't no, just no. Uh, be yourself. You can't just be like um impressed by reality in the face of it. Hmm. Well, I could try. I can yeah. make an effort. But, yeah. but 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 nonetheless, that if but it, okay in medium cool. If if um, the captain from the black hole had just been himself wandering around, it would not have been as compelling a movie. You did need the narrative uh, structure to it to bring forward the point that we've been. It's not a fantastical about. structure though. It's not like a fantastical premise. The idea that like no, that's a did I say fantastical? I said I think. Fictional is what fictional, I fictional, right? But uh, no, I'm not. You didn't say that, but I'm just thinking. You know, certainly the feeling that I had when I first saw Medium Cool, which was back when I was in college, yeah, in a film class, mm -hmm. was like a melancholy, a kind of wistfulness. Mm -hmm. But um, the sense that you got, also the treatment of it, like the city and the events going on around the DNC as backdrop, is that this little story could be happening thousands of different ways all around yes us, mm -hmm. all the time right and so it was kind of like very plausible as a slice of life kind of story right you know, it so was. It was realism no. yeah it was realism yes for sure um it's not, it's not a contrivance you know like as what an allegory it's not like no 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 contrived at all no it doesn't feel contrived it definitely feels like something that actually could happen and might even happen. and does happen all the time R right um what do you think about the this is maybe i'll cut this out maybe i won't what do you think about the movie slacker you talked about a thousand different stories happening well there's a there's a film where they're He's making an effort to bring all these different slices yeah. of life together into a, a filmic whole, and um, it's my favorite Linklater film. But uh -huh. you know, uh -huh. Uh -huh. for nostalgic reasons, probably. Um, but I could imagine attempting something like that, where we set people up to go into the around the convention and into the cities and film things, but with a character that they're. A version of themselves that they're playing. The version of themselves that they're playing. Yeah, yeah. yeah that they're yeah. kind of enacting. No, like, I mean, um, and Slacker is roughly contemporaneous with the last party. It is. It's the year before. Well, it was filmed in '89, I think. And but it's basically the same moment. Yeah. You know, it's the sort of end of the Reagan era. You know, mm -hmm. it's the dawn of the Clinton era. It's that that kind of moment. Mm -hmm. You know, it, there was a sort of a tone, kind of in the air. Right. I recall, and definitely Last Party has that feeling to it. Yeah. You 
um, that I think, you know, so, the, you know, can we capture the zeitgeist on yeah. the occasion of this election year and the crisis of these parties? Um, you know, Trump representing the crisis of the Republican Party and Biden representing the crisis of the Democratic Party. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, you know, I brought up 68 LBJ. You know, people think that Biden should drop out for the same reason that LBJ dropped out, meaning he should confess his failure regarding the Gaza war in the same way that LBJ confessed his failure regarding Vietnam. Um, <clears throat> now, you know, that's a little fanciful, but I think that is the idea. And, you know, the protesters in 68, so let's let's assume there are going to be protests at the DNC this year. There, there definitely are going to be. Yeah. Right. I mean, they're planned, but you know, August is a while away. So the RNC is first. Yes. And the DNC is a month later, which seems very protracted. Mm -hmm. Seems rather late in the game. And I think that a lot can happen between now and then to perhaps dispel the, the desire to protest. Mm. Yeah, it could be. And especially if it if the protest is just about the Gaza war, it might be about more than that. But if that's really what it's about, mm -hmm. then you know there's some reason to doubt. Now, in '68, were they imagining that Hubert Humphrey would somehow abandon his candidacy? So he was LBJ's um, vice president. He was mm -hmm. considered the pro-war candidate even though he was the civil rights candidate in a way that actually Robert Kennedy was not. So Robert Kennedy and JFK, Robert Kennedy kind of infamously was uh, more, more hostile to the civil rights movement than JFK was. And JFK was not necessarily terribly warm to it either. In fact, in 1960, it was Nixon mm -hmm. who was the civil rights candidate because the Republicans were the civil rights party. They are the ones who constantly year after year brought up civil rights legislation that was voted down by the Democrats. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And so they, the Kennedy brothers saw the civil rights movement as a, a challenge to the Democrats, which it was meant to be. And they did not mm -hmm. welcome it. LBJ, you know, famously reversed that you know, mm -hmm. made this push to make the Democrats into the Civil Rights Party. And Hubert Humphrey was part of that, right? He was very prominent. And yet he was also the pro-war candidate, supposedly, you know, um, at least that was the perception. And so what was the goal, right? There was Eugene McCarthy, who was the anti-war candidate, there was RFK who became a kind of anti-war candidate. Of mm -hmm. course, at that time, uh, Martin Luther King had become a vocal opponent of the Vietnam War, mm -hmm. um, as well as trying to steer the civil rights movement in a more labor direction. Mm -hmm. In other words, the idea being that now that civil rights legislation had been passed, now the economic interests of the working class needed to be asserted to really fulfill the right. civil rights legislation. And Hubert Humphrey was also um, supported by organized labor. So he was the civil rights candidate, the organized labor candidate, but also the war candidate. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of similarities um, to Biden. Right. Mm -hmm. But, but what, did they really, what, what did they expect to happen in 68, the, the new left protesters? You know, like that's really the question. What, what did they really want to have happen? I mean, I already mentioned that what they did was help uh, tarnish the image of the Democrats and bring Nixon to power. Yeah, but you got to put it in the context of 68 or globally, there was a feeling that um, revolution was in the offing, you know, that there was a, a chance for a new political power to emerge. And there had been uh, the 68 protests in 
France, as an example, but also in Mexico, and that that that, that was the a, a moment on the, in the New Left where horribly they, repressed in Mexico. Yeah, massacred, and on the I think on the eve of the Olympics, right? I believe that's right. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't I don't know that one as well as the the, the uh, French one because I wrote a novel about that. But anyway, <laughs> um, uh huh. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, the 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 point is, I think that they they felt that if they could bring down, they wanted to bring down the Democratic candidate, but they didn't want to live with the aftermath of that. They wanted to push on. I think to more revolutionary. Yeah, action. it's the crack up of the SDS, right? So the SDS, uh, the Students for a Democratic Society, were in the process of being taken over by the Maoists of the Progressive Labor Party. Right. Um, and uh, against them were the revolutionary youth movement, RIM. And there were two waves. There was RIM 1 and RIM 2. Right. And uh, these activists were involved in um, so a political crisis in the Students for a Democratic Society that played out at the level of like the Columbia University takeover in 68. The Praxis mm -hmm. Axis versus the Action Faction. So the Praxis Axis were the old SDS and the new SDS leadership, you know, Mark Rudd, who became part of like the RIM moment, the uh, Revolutionary Youth Movement moment. He was the Action Faction as opposed to the Praxis Axis. So the Praxis Axis were more like Marxist intellectual and the Action Faction were the, you know, kind of militant activist actionists, as Adorno put it in resignation. They were the actionists. And so they were rejecting the kind of Marxist approach, which was seen as too um, bourgeois, too reformist, hmm. too contemplative, too theoretical, right? Because the Praxis Axis were like, what are we going to accomplish by doing a campus takeover? How does that actually advance the working class's praxis towards socialism? And the action faction was like, fuck that, we got to do something. Right. Which so, is the watchword. Those are the watchwords of this moment. I mean, absolutely. I mean, I'm there is no praxis. There's no, prax yeah, there's no practice and access left except for maybe us. Yeah. I mean, the, the, that's what but, people recognize. Um, so the uh, yeah, whereas the uh, the Gaza protesters are um, the action faction. How can you say we shouldn't do this when we there's a genocide going on? Yeah, and a genocidal in war in Vietnam. That's what they said. Yeah, racist like, well, genocidal war in Vietnam. How can you not do something? And the Praxis Axis people were like, "Yeah, but do what? What will it accomplish actually? And how is this building the movement?" Right. Yeah. I mean, nobody wants to I, hear that ever. I tweeted, I tweeted out, I got a hundred thousand impressions on Twitter for tweeting out the, you know, the claim that the, the war in Gaza is genocide. It's justifying any action. It works like this. You know, how dare you tell me not to eat this orange? Don't you know there's a, a genocide happening in yeah. Gaza? <laughs> um, <laughs> so, um, Anyhow, uh, so the, so that the action, orange was picked by <laughs> Latin labor, which, which is, was, was my reason for from, saying don't eat it. You know, that was the whole reason I was rejected. from Native American victims of white settler colonial genocide. Exactly. Right. Who, which is why I was advising against eating it. Don't 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 participate in that stuff. Um, but no, I, oranges yeah. are genocidal. Of course they are. Absolutely. Isn't, so wasn't there a whole debate in the DSA about bananas? Oh, it's coffee, I think. Like bananas under socialism? Coffee definitely yeah. is. Yeah. Coffee for yeah. real. Right, fair yeah. trade or not. Right? Yeah. But bananas, wasn't there a, a, a debate in Jacobin in, in uh, the DSA about whether there will be bananas in socialism? Right. There well, there will be bananas only where they they are indigenous. You know, right. I guess. Right. And right. Yeah. So, um, so, you know, my gastrointestinal health will go out the window under socialism, I guess, because I yeah, don't you can eat bananas. Just get some supplements. You'll be fine. So the, you, you need know. the fiber, you need the stuff, you need the actual stuff. And, uh, you know, like, look, I'm a primate. I need my bananas. I don't know what those medieval Europeans were doing all those centuries. They're, they're pretty miserable, though. I mean, they yeah. were 
they were cooking up racist imperialist genocide because nobody gave them any bananas. <laughs> they were very pissed right. off. That's probably right. right. They were very constipated. And so they had to go out and take it out on the world because nobody nobody was sending them bananas. They didn't have coffee either, did they? I mean, they were really screwed in terms of They were, but they had self-flagellation. Well. They might do as well. No, that they might didn't have, have nicotine. Yeah. Um, they might have had coffee. Mm. Coffee is Middle East, isn't it? Yeah. So um, when did coffee get introduced? I they didn't have chocolate. They didn't have chocolate. Oh, they didn't have tomatoes, I don't think. And they didn't have potatoes. And they didn't have corn. So my gluten-free diet will go out the window, too, also for my GI issues. Right? Well, they, you're they lucky, though. I'm very dependent on, uh, you know, I've definitely gone native in my diet. Well, you're lucky, though, because you know, socialism won't really be achieved for 100 years yet. So, <laughs> Yes, yeah, so it's the DSA. Um, <laughs> oh, and and um, Caleb, they both yeah. were saying it would take a Oh, long really? Time. 100 years? Yeah. I yeah. think 30 or 40 years. Well, so yeah, I was going to say one we generation. Can about we, can one bring generation. It, we can bring it a lot closer, actually, if we, if we do it right. If everybody follows me. <laughs> yeah. We can get there in 30 or 40 years. I promise. <laughs> okay. All right. Guaranteed. Promise. Guaranteed. Guaranteed. You won't be here. <laughs> That's okay. You can, uh, you know, uh, dig up my grave and kill me again. Well, you might okay. actually be here in 40 years because, you know, look, Chomsky's still kicking despite rumors. To yeah, them. but, you know, I'm not an anarchist like that. In other words, I'm not Panglossian like that. Like motherfuckers can live forever because they're untroubled, right? They're they're very certain of their truth and their morality. You know, me not so much because you know, mm. socialism. I'm not so sure. I'm I don't have like a Kropotkin anarchist faith in human nature that Chomsky has. You know, I I know it can go any any number of ways, right? So, you know. Mm. Well, okay, so, but so back to the movies, and and so what you were saying, capturing the zeitgeist. Well, one thing we might do is demonstrate this repetition of the praxis axis uh, actionist faction split. Um, but I I'm not sure that in medium cool that was necessarily on display. It was sort of. I mean, it, I. Would you say medium cool was critical of the new left, or you know? No, you... no. I think um, again, it's backdrop for the film, right? And so it just is happening, and so I think it's treated as like a phenomenal manifestation of crisis. It's treated the way the Republicans treated it. A, a demonstration of societal failure. Um, right, uh, with different conclusions, you know, maybe. Right, Slightly different conclusions, but nonetheless, it was something that wasn't happening due to any political choice from any political actors uh, behind the protest. It was simply emerging. You know, back then, the Republicans were saying that it was all a communist plot orchestrated from Moscow. Like the Chinese one that's being that's going on and the Hamas and China like working together. Yeah, TikTok, um, obviously. Yeah. And of course, true, true then, true now. Right. <laughs> Meaning, of course, you know, the, the commies were behind it all in the 60s. Of course they were. Yeah, but... You know, TikTok all, but they, is behind it all now. No, no, TikTok is. isn't behind it all it now. Is. But. It is. It's TikTok videos who are radicalizing the youth, right? So it's uh, it's footage from Gaza. So don't count out it? YouTube like this. So don't count out the YouTube shorts. There's, they're also out there. But go I ahead. Think TikTok is maybe less censored. Mm, that's, uh, yeah, maybe. That's yeah, why they yeah. restrict that test. Yeah. You know, and so I think that um, I think that's what young people were seeing. They were seeing footage. And then certainly there was that thing. Was that Twitter or TikTok? where people were reading Osama bin Laden's manifesto. TikTok. It was TikTok, and then that was taken down. Yeah, and right? all the videos on TikTok looked the same. It was like, I can't believe it, guys. 
there's this, did you know that Osama bin Laden wrote a manifesto and everything he says in it is true? And they was like the, literally repeating the same script in every one of these. That's the way TikTok things. is. Yeah, I know. TikTok is about, um, what is it, the dancing weatherman? Do you know the dancing uh, uh, weatherman? No, 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 he's, he's weatherman. used in advertisements for TikTok. Oh. Uh, he's, he's like uh, kind of, you know, dapper, good looking gay man. I think he's on Fox. Mm -hmm. He's like some local like weatherman, and but then he's become a kind of celebrity figure because he's like the dancing weatherman, and so um, you know because that's a lot of TikTok is like dance dancing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's like Vine videos, right? Were the um, predecessor to TikTok, mm -hmm. and I feel like Vine Vine videos were about like dance, dance, and you know rap and and dance moves and. Is about popularizing like dance. Um, so you know, um, yeah, the kids are dancing to the tune of the Chinese Communist Party Pied Piper TikTok. They are, they are, and um, it's it's a it's a travesty because it leads to this. <laughs> action um, but <laughs> but no, radicalized by TikTok, radicalized by television, right. So but when we go to Chicago, and when I go to Chicago, you're already there, and, and to Milwaukee, um, you know, do you think that an aspect of the film we make should be this kind of meta commentary on yes. the state of the media? Yeah, I think so. But I, I think it will be difficult to do that when the media itself it, is its own self critique in a way that. Uh, it maybe wasn't the case during the, the age of network television and in Hollywood. Don't count it out. In other words, I think that there was a self-critical, self-reflexive aspect to television from the beginning. Right. Just as there is in film. If you watch like Hitchcock films, they're right. very reflexive and critical of the medium. You know, mm -hmm. and that's mainstream. I mean, it's always there. I think that for the artists, for the makers. It, it inevitably has this character because um, especially when the medium, the medium is very labor intensive. You know that from making your montage videos. Mm. Back then it was even more labor intensive than it is now. Mm -hmm. And it involves a lot of like obsessive replay of footage. Mm -hmm. and, and that carries over into the quality of the finished product. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, again, maybe in defense of Adorno, Adorno says, look, on the one hand, this appears to be a very naive kind of medium, photography and film. On the other hand, it's the least naive of all art forms. Because of the, how much uh, meticulous, detailed work goes into piecing together the images. Reproduction, the reproduction of reality. In other words, like, we might view it as just like a window on reality, but in many ways, it's even more constructed than painting mm -hmm. to achieve mm -hmm. that effect um, takes a lot of work. And so it's just hidden, you know? Um, and so that's, that's the paradox. So it, there are a lot of in jokes in, in um, advertising certainly in um, dr dramatic filmmaking, certainly. Um, maybe also at least the first generation of music videos, mm -hmm. maybe less so over time, but I think it's still there. It's like pop mm -hmm. songs have a lot of inferential stuff, a lot of reflexivity about the history of music. It probably goes over most listeners' heads, but certainly the makers are very aware. Right. right. And so, you know, if we're making a film, right? how could it not be the case? And so I just think that as soon as you put a camera on something, you change it. Yes, I do. I do think that's true. And, um, and it's very difficult work because I've tried my hand at filming. So, like I've done a lot of editing. I feel confident or competent as an editor. But when I put a, you put a camera in my hand, it just seems like the, the kind of shots that you that I want to get, the kind of images I want to produce, are de very difficult to actually capture. Um, and 
it most takes of the amount of planning. It does, and and money. I mean, most of the um, even with the digital cameras. I mean, you can do a certain kind of film, but um, without the li professional lighting and stage setting and all of that. Um, but you know, even just making sure that you've set up good shots and have good sound quality, you know, it's a trick and um, it takes an effort. I, I made a couple of videos where we went out and we shot. Um, we went to a Dollar Tree store and we went to the Ikea and we, we went to a record store and, and uh, a vintage shop. It was for like the one on consumerism. And uh, you know, it, it 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 took more time. It took a month to make that, even though we'd shot it in two days, rather than sure. what I could do in, in a week with just found footage. So it is uh, right, right, right. That's right. No, that's true. I mean, what I would say is, you know, I think that maybe the last Catron Zone we did was that we ended on De Mall, mm -hmm. right? And so I think that um, for the most part, people think De Mall is like about the medium so it's about like taking the medium and turning it mm -hmm. but isn't it rather taking reality and turning it well that is the aim yeah right and so that's where you know um there's something inherently surrealistic about photography about cinema mm -hmm. there's a kind of hyper realism to it mm -hmm. that that actually it's kind of an intensification of reality in a particular way. And I do think that like, um, because it will be us, you know, filming the DNC and the RNC or things going on around it, mm -hmm. that just the fact that it's us doing it is a detournable of the DNC and the RNC. That's yeah, that's true. And yeah. so we have to lean into that. Right. Which again, I think that, you know, there's just an unfortunate, I mean, you know that I teach in an art school. So there's an unfortunate way of assimilating all this to like irony, mm -hmm. a kind of ironization, a kind of postmodern ironical attitude. And I think mm -hmm. that maybe the, um, the millennials, I don't know about the zoomers, the millennials also had this kind of like, built-in self-ironization. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I think that you've talked about this maybe with Ashley about like how like millennial irony is being replaced with Zoomer sincerity. Yeah, well, right. Um, and I kind of feel like it's a false uh, dichotomy. I mean, it's a common one, but a false one, especially when thinking about, like we were talking about medium cool as like a verite. Like is right. verite sincere or is it the height of irony? It's kind of both and neither. Yeah, right. Right? And so I think we have to be aware of the medium in that way. And, you know, that it has that quality. I mean, I think different from, like, a podcast. From, like, you know, the Zoom call podcast genre doesn't have that, like, uh, no. sincerity, irony, character to it. And um, maybe talking heads in the news program don't have that either. Right. But I think um, field work you know, shooting in the field, film, video, um, has a different character to it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think that that we have to just, you know, be aware. I mean, look, the DNC and the RNC, uh, so in the last party, mm -hmm. Robert Downey Jr. basically asks, why are there even conventions anymore? Right. And they say it's a media event. Right. And if you recall, the last um, conventions were during COVID 2020. Yeah. And they didn't even let people in, I think. Well, hardly. the Republicans did, and the Democrats mm -hmm. did not. Right. So the Democrats did it all via Zoom, if you will. And the Republicans had a fair amount of it in person. And that was a gesture. But it was whether it was in person or not. It's all very, you know, mediatized, media scripted. It's a media event, and mm -hmm. you know, uh, it is like I don't know a several night long 
television advertisement, right? But it's also mm -hmm. like journalism, meaning you, you get to see what's going on. So it's a pre-scripted advertisement. It's, it's a propaganda performance, but it's also, you know, something might happen. Well, right. I mean, it, do you remember right. Tanner 88? Do you ever see uh, Tanner 88? Uh -huh. Well, in that one, there was a, there was Arbor right. Altman right, right. Uh, series and they, they ran a, an actor, the right. president he was right. playing a presidential candidate right. and they went to the conventions and they filmed there and they acted out these fictional scenarios where Tanner was trying to broker a deal to get the nomination at the last moment, right. trading delegates and things like that. And right. that, and that was, I think, the first time I realized, oh, yeah, their conventions are supposed to actually select the, the nominee. I was 17, you know. But, um, and, and that but, might happen this year if, uh, if Biden is taken out as the candidate. It might be. A, right. It might be. Right. A, yeah. And in 2016, there was, there was an whole, expectation that the Republicans would stop Trump at the convention. That's right. And they could still this year technically maybe you know stop trump if if if, if these can if the conviction you know it doesn't look like that's going to no, be no nobody is saying that he's an unviable candidate due to the convictions the republicans have lined up completely behind trump on this right to the but I mean, to the shock of the democrats the democrats are shocked you know that trump just in the past week was back at capitol hill he was at the capitol mm -hmm. building and he was received by the Republican congressional delegation, senators and representatives. And um, and the Democrats were saying, don't you remember that this guy wanted to kill you? How can you, mm -hmm. like the, the CNN, MSNBC people were like shocked that the, you know, it was like, don't you remember, you know, these Republican senators and Republican representatives, Trump like unleashed a mob to kill you, but you're welcoming him. How could that be? Mm -hmm. It's really crazy. And, um, but, you know, and if you recall the impeachment over January 6th was mm -hmm. a Hollywood produced video yeah, entered right, into yeah. the congressional record as evidence. Right. It was footage of the protests dramatized through editing. Right. And then if you remember Tucker Carlson released the footage of everything else going on at the Capitol at the same time, which just shows like nothing happening and people milling about calmly. Mm -hmm. And, and like the, didn't the want police to, opening the doors and things the like police that. Open, opening the doors and escorting people into the rooms. And um, so, but the Democrats didn't want that shown because that would spoil their narrative of what happened on January 6th. Mm -hmm. Right. And so it's a funny, it's a funny situation, but I do remember in 2016, there was some expectation that something might happen at the Republican convention, which I thought was far fetched. Right. You know, yeah. whereas this year it's the opposite. Something might happen at the democratic convention. Yeah. It's and, assumed that nothing will really happen at the Republican convention, but something might happen at the democratic convention, including Biden might drop, drop dead on the stage, you know, like anything might happen. Right. right. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, so what if so okay so we approach this i mean we're not I, we're not going to get in to the convention i maybe I can cut this out and don't, don't want to spoil anyone's expectations ahead of time but the point is we're going to be on the outside of this thing and we are are obviously going to be at a distance an ironic distance from it all as marxists as well sure and so the question becomes for, for, well from my pr perspective the the subject isn't really the parties and the people organizing the convention, but the people who are showing up to participate in it, whether they're there as protesters or delegates or what have you. I hope we or, can get it, some footage of some celebrities. Yeah, that'd be good. Hope we can do yeah. some some gotcha journalism, but also some invited interviews with um, <laughs> characters of the Democratic Party and the Republican Party. You know. Yeah. Could we, could we get an interview with AOC in Chicago? Well, that'd be awesome. That would be good. We should we should start working on that now. Um, right. Uh, um, we interview uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene. That would be good. You know, like a Marxist interviews Marjorie Taylor Greene. Mm hmm. A Marxist interviews AOC. Well, yeah. 
you know, Kamala Harris, we should try to get an interview with Kamala Harris. She loves Marxists. Her dad's one. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> Disowned uh, her. Did he? Yeah, he when? denounces her. He says that oh. she's giving a bad um, representation of uh, Jamaican culture. Oh, really? Because she's turned it into all about smoking weed. Oh. And he's like, no. Right? He's mm -hmm. a very kind of uptight Marxist, I guess. Marxist economist. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. He's like, I haven't smoked weed. I'm a Marxist. I don't know what my daughter's doing. Right. But he didn't just say, it's I just. how I raised her. No, yeah, I mean, right. he, he is. No, no, very. I mean, they are kind of estranged, actually. Oh, okay. Well, maybe then, maybe we don't have an in with with Kamala. Like <laughs> no, I mean, any more than we'd have with Pete Buttigieg, just because his uh, father was a professor of Gramsci. Oh, well, see, there you go. I forgot about that. We'll try to get Pete Buttigieg. Caleb then. Maupin uh, brought it up, right? Right. Uh, did he? Did yeah. he? I forgot yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, either yeah. he or Peter Coffin brought up the fact that Pete Buttigieg's father is a Gramsci scholar, and that didn't stop Pete Buttigieg from being an abject tool of the ruling class. And that's why Gramsci's mm -hmm. wrong. <laughs> Poor Gramsci. It's ridiculous. It's Gramsci ridiculous. wasn't a Trotskyist. He wasn't a Frankfurt school person. No. He's a, he was a Stalinist. Yeah, he was a Stalinist. He, he, you know, <laughs> he, was, he was fine. He passed his muster with them. So. Yeah. I don't know what, what they're on, and on about. Except that he's been misused. He's been canonized by the, by the um, woke... By the mm -hmm. PC woke. Yeah, the, Michael the, Brooks the, and the and um, others love Gramsci. They, yeah, they I wrote in my book. You know, problem is, uh, as Adolf put it, Gramsci is all things to all people. Mm -hmm. So poor Gramsci. Yeah, I have his prison notebooks right over here. Yeah, I have his political writings mm -hmm. before prison, and you know he was just like a. He was a second international Marxist. He was a third international Marxist. He was very much like Lenin or Rosa Luxemburg. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah, I have. Uh, I got that as a wedding gift from my best man. He's like, "Here, I want to give you the prison notebooks of Gramsci." And I'm like, "All right." So anyway, um, you of your, your anarchism. Yeah, uh, he just, just like he was to my right. You know, just like I, you might like this. I, you know, I've never I haven't read it, but here um so no so uh, it's um you know i don't know who the luminaries are i mean i feel like the republicans i mean steve bannon's gonna be in jail i guess yeah unfortunately um you know uh what about um larry kudlow or steve mnuchin or um light lightheiser what's what's his first name lightheiser they're like the core uh, economic crew. You mm -hmm. could ask them about value theory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That'd be uh, excellent. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> no, yeah, I, uh, yeah. Well, I, I definitely feel as though this will be a step forward in our collaborative process, Chris. As we was because you're as a video artist, you're going to. Uh, I hope take the reins a bit on this and help really make something out of, of, of the film uh, that comes out of going to these conventions. And um, uh, and I'm looking forward to it. And uh, it'd be nice to break from this. I do think that the the Zoom call format for podcasting is terrible. Like I enjoyed podcasting more when I didn't look at people when I was talking to audio. them. Audio. Audio only. And I, I edited think it. It's mostly cons consumed that way still. That's why people it always is. complain about our audio, because our audio is terrible on people with the headphones. I guess. Right. Well, I tried to or do some been. things about it to fix it, but yeah. I, and um, need but no, I, audio engineering. Yeah, I I well, when I started, I didn't have a, as good a microphone, and but I would take the audio and I would. It's the processing. Like, it's the processing. It, it, the levels. It took, yeah, it took me as long. Well, I, I level eight our our audio for the for the podcast, but um, what what uh, I used to spend as much time editing a podcast as I do a montage video now. I would and I would create audio montage sound videos. clips. Yeah, I remember yeah. all that. That's right. I mean, yeah. what 
what I would say about this is that, you know, it will be experimental. It'll yeah. be, it'll be avant-garde in that way. It will inevitably be. Um, mm -hmm. The medium does lend itself to that, actually, if you let it, you know, and so it's going to have to be some combination of spontaneous and planned. Right. And also post-production, um, you know, making it into something. Um, but let's talk about maybe uh, some of the substance of it. So I, I mentioned yeah, this sorry, before yeah. we started today, which is that um, Derek Varn oh, has yeah. gone on a Twitter tirade against me because of my Why Not Trump Again article, um, in which he contests my endorsement of unitary executive theory. So he basically says that I know better and I know that there's more to it than just trying to restore the status quo ante before the Watergate reforms. Mm -hmm. Yes and no. Right. And also that it doesn't matter what the founding fathers wanted out of the presidency. Um, the constitution evolves, jurisprudence evolves, society evolves. And so we're not in the world of 1776 or 1787 or 1789 anymore. And so mm -hmm. therefore it doesn't matter. Right. And so invoking, you know, executive prerogative via John Locke or what William Barr, you know, Trump's attorney general called the perfected Whig um, ideal of the executive in the in the presidency. None of that matters because the world has moved on. And, you know, and and, you know, I just think, well, I'm dealing with it at the level of the constitutional arguments that are being made, because any day now there's going to be a Supreme Court decision on presidential immunity. Mm -hmm. And, you know, given the makeup of the court, there is going to be a lot of constitution mongering. There's going to be a lot of strict construction, something, mm -hmm. right? And so that is certainly what the Trump case hangs on. And the Biden administration case or the Democrats case, it's unclear what it hangs on other than, well, we can't let the president get away with anything which is not a constitutional argument, because if they discover that the founding fathers wanted the president to get away with anything, then they'll rule accordingly, you know? Mm -hmm. And there's there's a lot of evidence for that, in fact, right? Um, so, you know, uh, I'm just dealing with it at that level. And, you know, I'll use a phrase from the Alternative to Genocide article, what do Marxists have to say about that? Nothing and everything. You know, on the one hand, you know, what do Marxists have to say about, like, U.S. constitutional theory? Kind of nothing, but also kind of everything, meaning Marxism does have a perspective on the bourgeois revolution mm -hmm. as uh, historical progress. And it does have something to say. It has a perspective on civil society and the state in capitalism, on the role of the state in capitalism and the crisis of civil society and capitalism. And that's what we're seeing, right? And so there's just some obvious points about, look, it's citizen Trump. Can we have civilian government? Can we have civilian government or not? Right? So, right. I mean, the, my question is when he says that you are ignoring the reforms and the limits that were placed on the executive before Watergate, uh, is that what that's what he said? Right. What, what What is he speaking to directly? But he's also yeah. saying the world has moved on since Watergate and since those reforms. And so you can't like to undo that would be to create something new and that that is the agenda of unitary executive theory of these kind of this Nixonite kind of project. You know, that William Barr and the Federalist Society, you know, might represent that they're not simply trying to restore the presidency but there's more intended than that. In other words, they are really trying to establish a kind of executive dictatorship that way. And I feel like, well, Dodge is the whole issue. You know, he claims to have read my article, Derek. Mm -hmm. And it's like, but wait, we're talking about the dictatorship of the deep state and whether the president is an empty suit. Right. Whether Trump is um, scandalous because he exposed that Obama was an empty suit. And again, the left kind of gets completely screwed up about this because the left is like, well, Obama and Biden, like they're just imperialists. And it's like, you know, actually, I think that they wanted to end the wars. I remember Biden when he was senator, where he was like, 
why are we still in Iraq? Maybe Iraq should break up into three different countries. We should wash our hands of it. Maybe it should be divided between the Kurds, the Sunnis, and the Shia. And what is the U.S. doing trying to cobble this country together, keep it together through extended occupation? Mm -hmm. That was before he was Obama's vice president. Mm -hmm. I wrote about that, too, at the time. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know? And, and Obama came in wanting to end the Iraq war and wanting to wind down the Afghan war. And Samantha Power proudly says, we learned the lesson that you can't do what you want to do because mm -hmm. there is a wisdom to staying the course with U.S. policy. And I think Trump represents a challenge to that. Well, just to be na naive here, if you were to increase the power of the executive, um, I mean, at the moment, in, in some ways, it does seem to me that the presidency, you know, the executive has a lot of power. And in, in there are two there executives, are though, right? There's the deep state. That's the executive. Well, I know, but I'm saying the president, the elected president, right? I'm talking about and the elected that's, president. That's, that's where they're in conflict. I mean, well, people just, don't want to eliminate the executive power. They just want to limit, severely limit the power of whoever's elected president in favor right. of the deep state. Well, right. That This is what I'm trying to get at. Because right. the executive has powers that by the, you know, just to be very simple-minded about this, I'm not a constitutional scholar. My, my understanding of American politics is much shaker than it should be given what I do. But... Um, it's all controversial, by the way, and some other things will be decided by the Supreme Court, like the Chevron Doctrine and things like that. What I remember is that the president's uh, ability to go to war should be constrained by the Congress and is not, right? That, 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 um, that's, again a, again, that's one thing. That's one thing. But can the president fire any U.S. government employee? And why not? Right. So, but when we're talking about expanding the power of the executive that Trump wants, we're not talking about as it is against the Congress or, uh, it is the, though, but check it out. So the deep state is set up by Congress mm -hmm. and the degree to which the president can't fire people in the executive. It's because mm -hmm. Congress set it up. Okay. And Congress has given administrative decisions by the bureaucrats the force of law. All right. Okay. Chevron doctrine. Mm -hmm. Right. Which might be undone by the Supreme Court. And everyone is like, oh, this will wreak havoc. It will make it impossible to do anything. Government can't function unless administrative decisions have the force of law. In other words, if you make Congress vote on everything, mm -hmm. it's going to be impossible. Like okay, so democracy has to be able to act on its own. Mm -hmm. Congress so, delegated the authority, gave them the power, and the president can't take it away because Congress did it. Yeah, but why is a, that not an, just a congressional check on the executive? Because they can't, con as, Congress can't do it either. In other words, Congress, I mean, nominally it can, but mm -hmm. in reality, Congress can't undo these administrative bureaucracies that they've set up. Because Why not? Because they're, they're there's never enough of a And there's not a consensus to do it. In other words, you know, I wrote about this in my article. I said, you know, who writes the laws? Who writes the laws? The congressional representatives and their staff do not write the laws. Lobbyists write the laws and bureaucrats write the laws. That's who actually mm -hmm. writes the laws. Mm -hmm. And then they shop around for congressional support. For those laws mm -hmm. and those laws right. dictate how the bureaucracy can act right so they they are a self-regulating autonomous thing that's been established and that can't be removed yeah and that's been since wilson to some degree and certainly since fdr to it's only accelerated over time in other words there have been waves you know, like Reagan, you know, the nine or ten scariest words, I'm from the government and I'm here to help you. He expanded mm -hmm. it massively under mm -hmm. his watch. He, with a Democratic congressional majority, mm -hmm. they expanded the bureaucratic state a great deal.
Yeah, that's what neoliberalism was all about, and to a large degree, even though it was supposedly claimed to be claimed to yeah. be uh, against the government, it ex massively expanded the government, and so mm -hmm. um, you know that's why it's post-Fordism. It is an anti-Fordism. Um, so it expanded the FDR New Deal state, which was itself expanded in the first Cold War. So the Reagan era is the second Cold War, but also um, the the Great Society and the expansion of both the New Deal and the Great Society under Nixon, mm -hmm. in fact, right? So, you know, we can't forget this history and fall for this stupid talking points of the parties. You know, the Democrats are for responsible government and the Republicans are the wrecking party. If you want to give, but let's try to give Varn the most charitable reading we can. What do you think that his concern is? Is his concern that Oh, this would be authoritarianism. In other words, that if the unitary executive theory can have their way, it's just going to, um, you know, reinforce the authoritarian character of the state, maybe the Bonapartism of the state, you know, etc. I mean, he was also complaining about that, that, that me and Spencer are talking about Bonapartism and imperialism just to troll the left and just to, you know... Uh, obfuscate, right? And, you know, and I just feel like, well, no, this is an uncomfortable topic because mm -hmm. um, the left could be and should be ambivalent, equivocal about this. Um, and I think that, you know, Derek himself might be more libertarian oriented in his predisposition, but also might recognize that he can't he can't quite go there. Like he's not going to just be a progressive Democrat, mm -hmm. but he might acknowledge the rationality of their position, and so he sees like unitary executive theory as greater <clears throat> arbitrariness. In other words, it basically puts faith in the self-regulating character of the deep state. But the reason that the, that the deep state is not a threat is that it has this self-regulating character. And it's like, but does it? And can it just drive off a cliff? I mean, meaning like the Vietnam War. Yeah, what is the, what is the theory of the self-regulating character of the deep state? What's re, what is, why is it self-regulating? How is it set in opposition to itself? And, and Well, not that way, right? But it is like the experts and their evolving consensus and their connection to like corporate capitalism and, you know, they're acting out of necessity, you know, in other words, that they, that you would trust that more than you would trust a demagogic politician who gets elected. You would trust the experts. I mean, look, Fauci is on his memoir book tour mm -hmm. and I'm sure it's not a happy thing for the Democrats because it's reminding everyone Mm -hmm. Right. And the Democrats are like the trust the experts party. And the Republicans are like, why should we trust the experts? And, you know, I always like to say Fauci was a lot more honest under Trump than under Biden, because under Trump, he was forced to say, look, that's beyond my pay grade. Like he was like, look, I'm a public health guy. I, I, you know, you have to balance needs of public health against the needs of the economy. But I don't really know anything about policy regarding the economy. And so don't ask me to balance those things. I can't. Mm -hmm. Right. And so who can? Well, of course, the president. In other words, like that's the point of having cabinet secretaries and, you know, of having mm -hmm. an elected administration, you know, that they're going to make that decision of balancing, you know, cost benefit, you know, with respect to public health po uh, policy and other other concerns, concerns about kids in school or concerns about job sites being kept open, you know, locking down the economy, right? So under Trump, Fauci, and now he's saying, well, it was very difficult for him and he had to be diplomatic and well, but I mm -hmm. felt like, no, he was being honest, mm -hmm. right? That, and now he's pretending, well, we did the best that we can as if there was no balancing involved, as if there were, there were not different considerations. Mm -hmm. Right now, he's just like, I did the best I can with the science available to me to do what was necessary for public health. Back then, he was like, look, I only know about public health. There are other things. 
Mm-hmm. Right. And, you know, but the trust the experts is if the experts say if the public health experts say shut down the economy, then we have to do it. What? Right. Well, the thing is that they, not only did the experts say we have to shut down the economy, they also said we have to shut down debate amongst the expert class. Yeah. And that's the um, other thing. So the presidency and the cabinet appointed by the president, they are supposed to mediate. Like, let's say that there is there is an economic administration bureaucracy and there is a public health bureaucracy. And then you get all the you get the economic experts and you get the public health experts, you get them in the same room. And who gets to mediate that discussion and then who gets to make the decision in the end? Right. And so the idea that it's self-regulating in the sense of, well, it's the experts and they know, they know. But it's like, but wait, th- there are questions of priority. Yeah. There and also political decisions to be made. And and in terms of Fauci's policies, he got almost everything wrong. You know, I mean, in terms of, like, you know, and not always maliciously by any means, but like. It's not malicious. He, it's it's just beyond his ken. Like I said, he said this is about. No, but even, on the, even just right. on the level of health, like he didn't. Oh, sure. You know, no, he did do some skullduggery, but that's just the world of the bureaucrat. Right. But, you know, like the lockdowns probably weren't the best policy. The mask mandates didn't work. I know that I brought this up with you before, but do you know that in 2018, there was a centenary of the Spanish flu epidemic observed? Right. And the government mm-hmm. produced a report in which they said, what if this happened again? And they said, we will try social distancing, lockdowns, masking. Mm-hmm. It didn't work then, and it won't work now. But we will do it because there will be such an overwhelming pressure to do something. Yeah. The government right. itself acknowledged this, and then they did it. Right. Right. There you go. But but to, just to, to hone in on this question of... Oh, it's a deep state's not malicious, but it's, it's incompetent at that level. At the level of, like, can we have a public debate over social priorities? That's, by the way, no. what the left wanted. The left supposedly right. wanted some kind of, like, lock down the economy in order to bring about socialism, meaning we're going to get socialism by people deciding to prioritize their health over their wage income. Yeah, I guess. Um, that, I don't know what they yeah. thought. They thought, well, the workers don't want to work in an unsafe place, and they want to stay healthy, and they want to keep their families healthy. I mean, so there, or, well, it was it was the Chris Smalls effect, right? He had COVID, the COVID threat coming into the Amazon warehouse. The Amazon bosses were not providing uh, PPE. They were not providing the social distancing that was recommended by the CDC. Um, they were not providing the sick leave that that was necessary to really um, combat COVID. Um, and they weren't informing. They weren't doing track and trace either. So if someone got COVID. And it, and had but even if they them. had done all those things, it still wouldn't have done anything. Right. But the idea was because of the failures of those of the Amazon, it's not about now. Now it's not about health. It's about the politics. Right. So the that led Chris Smalls to organize a walkout, to start organizing the Amazon workers, to create a movement for unionization in Amazon that has more, had more legs since he started than anything they'd seen up to that point. So there was this feeling that on that level, you could build organize- that. This is what the left yeah. throughout the world thought. And they thought you needed stricter lockdowns in order to give the workers more power. Hmm. And then the Republicans were there to say, well, most people are employed by small business, not by mega corporations. And the lockdowns are destroying all the small businesses. So it's not empowering the workers. It's creating a massive shortfall of labor which forces the corporate employees to do what they're told because they can't leave and get another job. Now, follow the logic here. I remember how I thought about this, and Derek Barn and I discussed it at the time. We said, well, look, if the government, if the state steps in and makes sure that the workers continue to get paid even as they're forced out of work and that the uh, companies, the big mega corporations, absorb all those all these businesses. Oh, no. Yeah, no. 
consolidate all the small businesses as if yeah. Amazon can run my Thai restaurant down the street. Right. They can't. Then, I know, right. I know. But this was the thought. Then it will actually be better for workers because working actually in a big corporation, you have more, you're brought together more collectively and you have more potential to organize politically and, you know, and unionize in a big corporation. Talk about and, delusional. Yeah, I know. But that was what we said. No, because people were hoping to find the silver lining in the cloud. Whereas I'm here, of course, I'm Adorno, right? <laughs> right, the Adorno meme. I'm here yeah. to find the cloud in every silver lining. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, um, you know, I mean, I just, I mean, look, profits over people, what else is new? Oh, I know, yeah. The idea you're going to use a pandemic to reverse that no. no i know it was it was misguided no, it was and misguided. also the republicans are there i watch fox news guess what they're yeah. saying these fox news pundits they were like the covid lockdowns involved the most massive wealth transfer to the wealthy to the rich that has ever taken place which is true the covid lockdowns resulted in a massive upward redistribution of wealth Mm-hmm. Nothing like it has ever been seen in all of history. Wow. Even more than 2008, which also yes, was a massive. Which was problem. because of consolidation. Yeah. But this was, um, and of course, what they're complaining about, speaking about petty bourgeois democracy, they're complaining about the fact that the mega corporations absorbed all of the wealth of the small businesses that were ruined. Right. And that's what we were saying would happen, but they would some of the working class would benefit by being employed by the new mega corporations, you know, which was delusional. Well, the but only that, way look, that um, Amazon could do all the logistical work that they were expected to do under the lockdowns was to increase automation. And right, increase unemployment. And that's also occurred. That's also occurred. So there's been a massive wealth redistribution upward, and there's been a massive increase in automation. Which which the declining rate of profit? I'm sorry, I don't know why you're so down on the declining rate of profit, but that will bring about future economic crisis down the road. Is that? Oh, well, of course it will. No, no, no. Of course it will. No, no. no. It's just not going to bring about socialism. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> right. It's just yeah. not going to bring. Right. It's not going to bring about socialism, nor is it going to bring about techno feudalism. It's just going to bring about massive dislocation and misery and suffering of the working class. To right. Force, force to adjust. We should, well, I, I, I don't root for the declining rate of profit. I think, you know, <laughs> you think I do. You, you, think be careful. I, you have to be careful. Meaning you have to, you, you know, like in other words, pinning our hopes mm-hmm. in the fall of capitalism. You know, whereas I'm like falling rate of profit, falling rate of schmoffit. You know, I'm like... <laughs> There, what about the countervailing tendencies, Doug? What about that and, and Marx? What right. about the countervailing? Because you were reading, you were reading the Communist Manifesto back to Caleb Maupin and saying, "Well, mm-hmm. you left that out." I'm here to say, Doug, you leave out the countervailing tendencies <laughs> of the falling rate of profit, because the countervailing tendencies are what save capitalism all the time. <laughs> well, not always. Sometimes the we've had this falling the- rate of profit since the Industrial Revolution. Look, sometimes the actual decline is what saves capitalism. The, the devaluation sure, and sure, depression, sure, sure. That, you know. Right, right. I mean, so I'm not, I'm not saying that devaluation itself is going to cause socialism, and I, and I do it. But you know that the left does. Yeah. Well, you know right. They do. They think that Marx is talking about the inevitability of socialism. I'm like Marx is talking about at this point in 2024. Marx is describing the inevitability of space fascism. Right, 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 right probably. But, but, but. Oh, by the way, I saw the original volume of Marx's Das Kapital read by Eugene Debs in prison. Oh, really? And when the the uh, curator heard that I was a, a Marx academic scholar, she took it out of the case. She says, "I'm not supposed to take it out of the case, but I'm going to take it out for you." Nice. And also all three volumes of Capital, but he 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 acquired those later after he was out of prison. So they had volume one, which he read in prison, and then they had all three volumes, which he read when he got out of prison. And so they were all there. And so Eugene Debs and his wife 
read and reread and discussed and had friends over all three volumes of Das Kapital. They were not ignorant of any of this. Okay, good. Uh, I'm glad to hear that. But when was he? So, but after 1890s. Yeah. 1890s. So right. fresh off the press. Three well, when, wait, when was he in prison though? Which, which time? Oh, okay. 1890s. I thought it was. I thought it was. Um, Pullman Street. Around, oh, okay. It was not the. He didn't read it in prison when he went to prison. No, no, that's a different time. prison. No, he was already a Marxist at that point. All right, right. No, this is where okay. he uh, he read Kautsky and Marx in prison. Okay, so but my and that's you know I I don't doubt it. So we should take Eugene Debs much more seriously than we have. Than and I, I have a, I have news for you. He understood capital better than we do. I'm sure he did. I'm sure he did. Because he's motivated. I'm, because he's dealing with like the reality of a workers' movement in a high uh, era of industrialization. Meaning it was just much more real. It was like in the flesh real in a way that for us, we have to sort of say, well, isn't this that? Well, look, in 2008, 2009, when I was working at Comcast and feeling like that job wasn't very secure and I didn't have, and I was watching my, you know, it was all personal, but I, I, I felt it was real. That's why I was so interested in it. It was not because I was, um, it was self, it was, I was motivated by the time. So I was not motivated by some academic interest in, in the topic but but to go to go back to this thing about um look the, the whole thing with derek Vaughn and i you know the way we thought about this back when the pandemic was happening it was motivated to by an attempt to look for the silver lining you're absolutely correct and one of the reasons what was motivated in that direction was because of uh, an absolute conviction, which we which we tried to push against, but which was deep in a, in our politics, that the Republicans and the people who were on the right were just very sacrificing humans for profits. Which, well, that's one way of expressing it. But even before the pandemic happened, like just overall, anytime hey, there was a hint yeah. that you might actually help the Republican Party, you really had to. Oh, that's right. So, no, I mean, look, I mean, Trump, um, you know, I think that this election will be a referendum on COVID again. And it works against the Democrats. And I think Trump occupies the exact middle. Mm -hmm. Right. So he's pro vaccine, pro lockdown, but not excessive. Right. I, I think I think for the left this is a not a referendum on COVID. They've forgotten it for the well, left. Well, the left, but who cares about the left? They don't affect the election. But no, but look, in 1968, they made a ma they had a major effect. The left had a con was consequential in getting Nixon into the White House, right? So there are two things that happened. There was a demoralization, but there was also the splitting of the Democrat vote by George Wallace, mm -hmm. the Dixiecrats. And that obviously helped Nixon. I mean, Nixon then had an overwhelming victory in 72. So, um, I mean, the Biden administration definitely looks like a McGovernite circus, mm -hmm. you know? And again, it's not out of like anti-trans bigotry or anything. It's just like, isn't this going a little too far? Like in other words, mm -hmm. the popular perception I mean, look, the Republicans are not arch reactionaries. They're not. They're go slow progressives. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. And, you know, and they have their bargaining chips, meaning they have their right wing that might want to turn mm -hmm. back the clock. But generally speaking, and certainly Trump is not interested in undoing LGBTQ. He's not. <laughs> No, but he wasn't even what he, interested in undoing abortion, really. No, he wasn't, but that got away from him. Right, but, he got away from him, and now he wants to sort of put the genie back in the bottle. I don't think he's going to be able to. He but, wants to but, establish, like, basically, France's laws on abortion. Right. 15 weeks. Yeah. So that might sense. happen. That might happen. It might. It just Probably won't happen not. because it doesn't work that way. They can't legislate it federally. Right. But it might happen piece by piece, maybe. It might. You know. But 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 the um the 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 for the for socialists though it matters what the left 
does, doesn't it? Don't we want to do? Well, for me, it matters what the left does because I feel like how many generations of young people are we going to turn off to socialism by turning them on to socialism? But really, socialism is just some nihilist fantasy of breaking up the United States and you know restoring Turtle Island. You know, mm-hmm. comrade number three, the Navajo activist. It's like, well, you know, Turtle Island didn't belong to the Navajo. So the Navajo <laughs> might want, you know, the whole Turtle Island, but they have to wipe out the other Native Americans in order to achieve that. <laughs> right. I mean, so, remember when the Europeans arrived, it's not like the Native Americans weren't killing each other. They were. I know. And that's imperialist propaganda. No, it's not. No, it's <laughs> not. <laughs> you know, um, hunter gatherers try to wipe each other out, they enslave each other. They do. And certainly civilized people, and there were, you know, civilized Native Americans. There were mm-hmm. the Aztecs and the Incas, and they definitely did genocide and slavery. They did. So, mm-hmm. you know, uh, yeah, we could restore that, you know. We could restore the Aztec Empire. That's cool. I, I don't think we can, actually. But, but yeah. but Oh, Mexicans might want it. The car, so- drug cartels definitely love it. Well, okay, but that would that really be a restoration? I don't think so. No, it's not. Right, it's not. But yeah. you know, like techno feudalism run by Aztecs. Oh. <laughs> right. Okay, that might be cool. <laughs> yeah, as a I science like fiction. I love, I, I love their art, you know, and be fun on the cover. Yeah, but oh, but, it's um, kitsch. It's socialist realist. It's manly <laughs> man. Have you been to a Mexican restaurant recently? Those paintings um, are yeah. out of hand. Like but, the, but the, Aztec the rippling art. muscles. No, of course that's not it. I'm talking about the the Mexican Aztec nationalism. Oh, you I know, see. The weird, the weird European fascist version of Aztec. No, I mean, of course, if it's a Guatemalan like knitted poncho, then yeah, I guess that's not too fascist. Although I'm sure it has some like human sacrifice woven in there. <laughs> what were Have they saying seen- about the design of the swastika? Like they were caricaturing poor Wilhelm Reich. They were saying that Reich thought that um, the swastika looks like an orgy. <laughs> did they? Yeah, they did say And I was that. like, yeah, Reich might have said that. He might have said all sorts of things. But I was like, um, yeah, I don't know, you know? Well, so, look, I felt like once I get, got into that terrain, I almost tried to start defending Freud and psychoanalysis and all that. I just said, no, I just, this is. I mean, Reich is iffy. I mean, I think that book is good, generally, The Mass Psychology mm-hmm. of Fascism. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, he's got a lot of good stuff, but then, you know, it's also a little iffy. I mean, he rewrote it, you know, so it's a 33 book rewrote in 46, 46, a little bit. He gets a little iffy, right? No, I mean, look, like, look, the history of psychoanalysis has been a history like the history of the left. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. It's been a history of regression and degeneration. And it is. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. certainly is. That's right. Um, so. In some ways, maybe more so. I mean, so again, I mean, I like, I'm not going to sit around and like defend Artie Lang either. Right? No, 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 no. Well, Artie you know, Lang I mean, is something else. I, I mean, know he's something like else. Reich is better. I mean, at least he wanted orgasms. Right. No, I'm not. I, I'm. I'm just saying there was a trend towards this sort of, I don't know, romanticized, hedonistic, yeah. orgiastic, and and, uh, but most of all, kind of a romanticization of of insanity in art with Artie Lang yeah. and and so. Yeah, I, I don't want to sit. I don't want to have to sit down and I would did not want to try to pick apart what was best in psychoanalysis. No, no, not in that conversation. Definitely not. But no. what, how did I get off on that? Um, I have see. a question for you about yeah, yeah. films. Have you ever seen the movie Tribulation ninety nine? That I don't think so. It's a nineteen ninety one science fiction collage film hmm. by a guy named Craig Baldwin, and it's uh, like a it's made out of. So old science fiction like films found and footage. found footage and it's all about how Quetzalcoatl in league with the CIA yeah. came comes back and and invites the aliens to take over the earth and defeats American imperialism and alien versus predator, <laughs> yeah. predator has established human sacrifice on earth right mm-hmm. and they use the aliens to perform the human sacrifice yeah, but you should watch it. It's a, it's I, I, yeah. It was very. I saw it in '91 when it was released, and and uh, got it on video cassette, and it was like 
an eye opener. I was like, oh, anybody can do this shit. <laughs> so, so, oh, you mean this kind of filmmaking? Yeah, this sort yeah. of collage film uh -huh. narrated. I was ahead uh, of you there because I was um, basically studying film in college. Right. And already started yeah. to make things. Yeah, I didn't. I was all do it. You're, you know, di autodidactic on the on all of that stuff. I didn't get a degree. And I studied in, with you know, um, avant-garde film and video artists. Right. You know, which probably was really good to to have done. Probably. Get, oh yeah. You know. Now the film history that I got was very solid. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so this is even before I went to the Art Institute, which also was a great education and that stuff, and also had. Yeah. You know, avant-garde the filmmakers and video artists so it's um but yeah i mean the film is going to be a challenge i think that we need to capture the moment mm -hmm. and you know it is complex but there are characters there are figures you know there mm -hmm. are things going on and there is this sort of ambient ether of ideology in terms of the partisan politics and um you know i think that um, you know, Reagan tried to hijack the Republican Party in 68, but he failed mm -hmm. to do so, mm -hmm. right? So he was fended off by, at that time, the mainstream Republicans represented by Nixon. But then Nixon also flipped the script on the mainstream Republicans as well, right? And so he wasn't a Barry Goldwater guy, and he wasn't a Reagan guy, Nixon. And mm -hmm. that's why I think that Nixon is... Um, a model for Trump. You know, he's much more of a Nixonite. And, you know, so again, back to the unitary executive theory and how this decision might come down from the Supreme Court, and I'm not predicting anything, but I think that the left will be horrified if presidential immunity is granted by the Supreme Court. And I think they should not be horrified. They should not be surprised. They should not be horrified. They should be prepared. And I do think that in all my writings on Trump since 2015, I have been trying to not defend Trump, but defend reality so that the left is not left shocked and unprepared, right? And also to, to understand that that reality is contradictory reality that comes from a contradictory history. Mm -hmm. You know, the fact that the Republicans have to stand for civil liberties and constitutional forms against the mendacity of the Democrats, going back to Woodrow Wilson, giving lip service to the Constitution while really violating it in practice out of the exigencies of capitalism, that the left assuming that that's social political progress, even cultural progress, is mm -hmm. remarkable. You know, because again, Eugene Debs, he was against Woodrow Wilson perhaps even more than he was against Theodore Roosevelt and Robert Taft, mm -hmm. right, in the 1912 election. Um, that was the high point of secondary national socialism in the United States and in Germany, too. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, and, and Lenin took note. You know, and said this is this is a manifest crisis. The capitalist parties have to overthrow their constitutions to to keep capitalism going. Mm -hmm. You know, and you know he would, of course, not have disagreed with Debs, who said that the constitution belonged to the working class. You know, I mean, the socialist party did want to make changes. They did to the constitution. They did. However, they they wanted to make changes to it in the spirit of it. Mm -hmm. Where the left today thinks that the constitution, the spirit of the constitution is wrong. Mm. And that's just mistaken. That's profoundly mistaken. And in that they're agreeing with the, the, the capitalists. Right. right. It's the capitalists who think that the constitution, you know, it's like a fiction and it's just words on paper and they think it's a scandal that there's a supreme court who might actually take the words on paper too seriously that's what the scandal is right you know yeah and what else do we have in other words in the united states citizenship is based on the constitution it's not based on some 
tribal kinship. Right. You know, it's not a blood and soil. It's not because my ancestors lived here. My ancestors did not live here. Right. You know, um, it's just not, you know, and so, uh, you know, as, you know, like, we should definitely try to interview Vivek Waramaswamy. Yeah, we should. Whole, his whole candidacy was based on being an American by choice. Yeah. And that's that's the world. That's what, that's what the left in the United States doesn't understand. The third world is rich people and poor people. The middle class are leaving. And where are they going? The United States. If you enjoyed this conversation, please do consider supporting us on Patreon. Our patrons help to make sure that Sublation Media can continue to provide interviews, videos, books, and articles that are critical of the left from the left. If you are tired of remaining stuck within bourgeois ideologies and politics, help us sublate them both.